to go. Okay. Albert Einstein, if we think of the field being removed, there's no space which remains, since space doesn't have an independent existence. Reality is merely an illusion. It's clear that the space of physics is not in the last analysis anything given in nature or independent of human thought. It's a function of our conceptual scheme. Space is a function of mind. And then at the end, Albert Einstein, after he worked the last 25 to 30 years of his life trying to come up with a unified field theory toe, little toe, and didn't succeed, a letter to one of his uh, co-workers, one has to find the possibility to avoid the continuum together with space and time altogether, but I have not the slightest idea what kind of elementary concepts could be used in such a theory. You see, they knew that the time of Newton was finally over, but they just really didn't know what to do with it. Because just knowing the fact from an experiment isn't enough. You have to have an explanation. You have to be able to relate it to the world before it's, it's useful. Okay, the next one is Wigner. It will remain remarkable in whatever way our future concepts may develop that every study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. Max Planck, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of the mystery we're trying to solve. See, that's like Einstein saying, the space of physics is a function of our conceptual scheme. What's out here, our reality is somehow entangled with what's in here, is what they're saying. All right. Okay, now we're gonna have one from Niels Bohr. Bohr said, the common sense view of the world in terms of objects that really exist out there, independently of our observations, totally collapses in the face of the quantum factor. He meant in the face of quantum mechanics, new knowledge that they just had. Also from Niels Bohr, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Okay. So these are all, all these people I just quoted were all Nobel Prize winners, all of them. They were all the best of the best, probably the best scientists, the most creative and, and out of the box thinking scientists that we've seen for a you know, hundred years. So that's what they thought at the time. Contemporary scientific big picture, we have about 1992, okay? That's 60 years after the double slit experiment. We have Edward Fredkin, who is still a working, well thought of physicist, strong reputation. He was a professor at MIT, then went to Boston University, and then I think to Carnegie Mellon because he was more into computer works and Carnegie Mellon is center of excellence for computer work. So Fredkin is a, is a pretty uh, solid source. He says reality is essentially informational. It's just informational. That it's a simulation. That our reality, we're living in a simulation. That reality is information. It's digital. Time is digital. When I say digital, I mean it's broken into discrete chunks. It's quantum broken into chunks. Okay, that's the nature of reality. Okay, that was reported in a physics form back in 1992. He didn't just say that because it came to him in a dream. He did a lot of science and he had a lot of equations to support that. Nick Bostrom, he's a uh, head of a department now at Oxford. Are you living in a computer simulation? He has degrees in both physics and philosophy. His answer to that was, it's very likely that we're all living in a simulation. Brian Whitworth, published his in referee journals as well. He took the data points, what I call you know, the data, the, the, the facts that we know that physics has discovered by experiment. Here are the facts. And he says, which theory best fits the facts and has the fewest problems and answers the most facts or explains the most facts? The reality is virtual and computed or reality is objective. And he didn't have a dog in the fight either way. He was a computer scientist, and he wanted to know. So he did the research, and then he published it, and his last paragraph in his paper said, physicists, wake up. A virtual reality is a much better model. It fits the data better than the old Newtonian objective reality. So now we're seeing a fair amount of movement out there. Digital physics now is all over the world. There's a lot of digital physicists who are agreeing with Fredkin. So we're kind of moving in that, in that direction. 
Of course, breakthrough, you know, always comes from the fringe. It comes from out on the edge. Breakthrough never comes from the middle. The middle isn't there to make breakthroughs. The middle is there to provide resources, infrastructure, and support. Because if it needed a breakthrough, then it needs something that nobody knows. You know, breakthrough is sudden new knowledge. Well, sudden new knowledge doesn't just erupt up out of the, out of the middle. It comes from the outer edges. It has to exist out on the fringe for a while before it slowly makes its way to acceptance into the, into the center. But now let's get into what does this have to do with consciousness? We're going to slip from physics into, into metaphysics. Consciousness is the fundamental reality. The larger consciousness system is a digital information system. Okay, digital information system. Now you can, you can think of that practically by thinking about what is your reality. What's the reality you're in right now? How do, you, how do you get this reality? It's just data. It's not only just data, it's digital data. You have photons that make, hit your retina, that retina produces an electric signal. That electric signal is a discrete signal, it's data. That electric signal creates patterns of neurons, fires neurons off, and it ends up with patterns of neurons, okay, in your central nervous system. That's just data. Neurons are discrete particles. So what is this reality? It's, you know, five senses, right? Sight, hearing, touch, it's all that, smell, and it's all just data. If that data could be impressed on your brain, if you put on a helmet and it would take all that same data and press that on your, bra on your brain, you would find, you'd see this reality. That's how you interpret the data. All those little patterns of neurons and electrical signals look like this, sound like this. That's how you interpret them. Okay, so now we take one step removed. This is a virtual reality. You don't have a physical body or a physical brain, either one. You're just consciousness. And you're getting a data stream that it has all that data. And you're interpreting it according to the rule set that defines this virtual reality. Virtual realities have to have rule sets. You know, what, what's the physics? How does the virtual reality work? So your consciousness, you're getting the data, and you have to define it in terms of this rule set. And you're thinking, well, that'd be hard to learn, that rule set. You know, how would you take all those little impulses and neurons and, you know, Teach yourself that it's this. Well, that's what we do in this reality when we're born, when we're infants. Okay, that's what we're doing when we're lying there, you know, making gurgling noises and an arm shoots over and we don't know that's our arm, you know, just something was there. It's, it's probably three or four weeks go by before the baby even knows that that arm's attached to him and that he has some will to move it. So he's learning. You see, how to interpret this reality. Somebody comes up and speaks to him. His ears give him digital data. He learns to interpret that data as mom or dad or baby sister. So that's how we learn to interpret those electrical pulses and those patterns of neurons to be this reality. Okay, and what's that baby doing? He's interacting within the rule set of a virtual reality. Okay, so consciousness is just information. Our awareness here, this reality, is just information. Now, at the most fundamental level, information is bits. So if you take information and break it down to the smallest particle, it's a bit. Smallest piece of information. Bits, in the most simple configuration of bits, are binary. Ones and zeros. Up, down, left, right, hot, cold. Good, not good, whatever. Just a, a pair of two, two different states. Okay, now information is non-physical, information is subjective. Okay, consciousness is non-physical and subjective. Okay, what that means is that every one of us gets our own personal data stream. Okay, this is a multiplayer game. So we're all in here together. We interact just like in The Sims or the World of Warcraft. It's a multiplayer game. And you, uh, you get this data stream. You have other players. Some of the players are maybe computer players, some of the other, uh, other, car other uh, people that are in the game. And uh, it's your own personal data stream. 
You live in your own personal reality. Okay, we think there's a big reality out there besides that, but it's just, your reality is just what you perceive. You take out all those senses, eliminate your five senses, and what's, where's your reality? It's gone. No touch, no sight, no sound, no smell. Where's your reality? You're in the void. There is none. You see, you have your own individual data. You create your own reality. You are, you are a reality. <laughs> your view of reality is, is yours. It's personal. Consciousness is subjective. Our interpretation of the data is subjective. Okay, so when we get this data stream and we've got data now, okay, we've learned how to interpret it, but that interpretation is subjective. It's our own interpretation. It's personal. You may find it unusual that information is non-physical, but if you think about it a minute, of course information is non-physical. Look at a book. Well, a book's a physical thing, but a book, that's the media. Right? The paper's the media. The ink in the book are the symbols, the code symbols. The ink is physical and the paper is physical, but that's not the information. Information is the meaning, the content, the message. The media and the code symbols aren't information. They're just ways of recording and transmitting information. But the information, to get the meaning, you have to have a consciousness. You can take a picture of that book page, but the camera doesn't get any meaning. It just captured an image of the book and the code signals. It takes a consciousness to find the meaning, so to get the information. So information's not media, information's not code symbols, information is content, it requires a consciousness. It's non-physical, you can't take meaning and weigh it, it doesn't have volume, it takes up no space, it's not physical. Okay, information systems. I'm gonna talk a little bit about evolution. I'm trying to bring together this whole idea of consciousness, virtual reality, and the fact that our reality is probabilistic and statistical. Information in a digital system is recognized by organized bits, right? Information systems have entropy. Now, entropy is a physics word. It comes out of thermodynamics, and basically it's a simple concept. It's just a measure of disorder. So you have maximum entropy when everything is just random. Okay, no structure, no order, just random, high entropy. You start taking those pieces, putting them together in special ways, and you can actually create content. You can create meaning. Maybe those, those things were uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of alphabet letters, and they're just thrown around random, no meaning. Put them in the right order, you spell words. Maybe they were just patterns. You, know, you could have a pattern that would go up, 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 down, down, up, 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 down, down, and a pattern. There's information there because what's the next three? Up, 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 because they just went down, down, right? So that has information. It tells you what the next thing's going to be. So it doesn't take just written words for information. Information can be in patterns. So a large, complex information system, okay, now this is going to be a self-changing information system, obviously. If it's going to evolve, it has to be able to change itself. To be self-changing, it also, at least some rudimentary way, has to be self-aware. It has to be able to know what it's, you know, what it's changing itself to is better or worse than what it had before. So, um, a self-changing system with a purpose to evolve, be more successful, you know, it's required to do that in order to survive. It has to evolve to survive. It can de-evolve, which means it throws everything back out on the floor in a random motion. You know, there's no content there, and then it's nothing. It doesn't exist as a system anymore. There's no information, it's just noise, just randomness. So it's by evolving and lowering its entropy. Lowering entropy is more order. Raising entropy is more disorder. Okay, so consciousness is a self-aware modifying system evolving toward lower entropy states. 
because that's what systems do. Self-changing systems evolve toward more profitable states. For an information system, that profitable state is evolves toward more content, okay, more order. Here would probably be a good place to make a uh, comment about free will. Okay, free will is a is important here because we're talking about decisions, right? We're talking about evolution. We're talking about changing. Okay, so free will is not a magic thing. Uh, there are many many people have a very strange view of free will that. Uh, ends up with all sorts of problems with it, but it's, it's their concept of free will is the problem, not free will itself. Free will is a simple thing. You have, in any particular time, in any particular circumstance, you have certain choices that you can make, certain choices that you're aware of. Now, the choices that you could possibly make is maybe a set this big. There's maybe 100 choices you could possibly make, but maybe there's only 20 that you're really even aware of that you could make. It's just that 20 that you're aware of that you could make makes up a thing I call your decision space. That's all the decisions, all the choices that you can make are that 20. Okay, that's your decision space. Now, you have free will to choose one of those 20. That's what free will is. It's the, it's the freedom to make a choice of the choices that are in your decision space. Now, the more your reality grows, the bigger your decision space gets. So decision space goes up and down. You know, you get thrown in jail and your decision space just gets smaller because there's a lot of things you can't do now that you used to be able to do. So decision space goes up and down. People who uh, become suicidal, their main problem is the size of their decision space. It narrows way down. There's nothing in their reality anymore except that one thing that upsets them. It's that one thing that's so horrible. All the rest of the things, all the potential, all the nice things that could happen, all of the, you know, the other possibilities that could happen in their life don't exist. Their decision space is just down. It's so narrow that only, they can only see that awful, awful event that they can't stand to live with. That's the problem. Okay, they have a very small reality. So the size of your decision space is a measure of the size of your reality. So not only do all have independent realities, all have <coughs> subjective individual realities, but they're all different sizes. Some people have big realities, some people have little realities. People that travel a lot tend to have bigger realities than people that never leave home. See, it's just, that's what free will is, okay? So you only need to have enough freedom to choose within your decision space. That's free will.